Okay, uh, very well. So welcome uh, to this session of the uh, um, uh, of our seminar. Uh, Nikita, I give you a floor. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, uh, basically some analysis, uh, but uh, this is an, a problem in analysis which has uh, appeared in a very large number of uh, examples in geometry. So that's kind of how I got to it. Um, and in particular, this problem, this kind of, there's been a lot of uh, confusion uh, as to the, kind of the results related to basically singular perturbation theory of Riccati equation. Um, so, and I uh, kind of do, doing some, or uh, trying to solve some geometric problems, I encountered this problem and I was myself uh, very much confused. And so uh, that's how I got into trying to understand the singular perturbation theory of a Riccati equation. And so hopefully uh, this work, which some of it is already out, some of it should be out soon, and some of it is sort of quasi in progress. Hopefully that uh, the series of works should address all these confusions and kind of um, establish some solid base. Um, okay, so let me try to uh, kind of get to the main result as quickly as possible. Uh, so, okay, so what are we talking about? So consider uh, 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 the following differential equation. Uh, so there's h bar times d by dx f. So it's an equation for f, first order differential equation, af squared plus bf plus c uh, plus c. So it's a uh, first order nonlinear differential equation, uh, perhaps the simplest example of a nonlinear differential equation, with, which is just quadratic instead of being linear. Um, so equations of this form are called uh, Riccati equation. Um, so here, the coefficients a, b, c, um, are going to be meromorphic functions of two variables for me. So everything is uh, in the complex domain. So these are uh, meromorphic functions of two variables, x and h bar. Um, both of these are complex and the kind of domains that I will consider are the following, so x for now is just uh, any, any domain in the complex plane, uh, could be unbounded. Uh, and S is also a domain in the complex plane with coordinate CH bar, uh, but this one I want uh, to be a neighborhood of the origin, uh, a sectorial neighborhood of the origin to be precise. So this is a sectorial neighborhood of h bar equal to zero uh, with opening angle uh, at least pi, or let me just say pi, um, and um, with bisecting direction uh, some kind of uh, phase theta. So in other words, the opening, so i.e. opening is just the interval, uh, you know, theta minus pi over two to theta plus pi over two. So um, to give you some pictures, so first of all, uh, so here is my h bar plane. Here is the origin. And let's say uh, I have some kind of bisecting direction like this. So that's point, pointing in the direction of, maybe I should say, I should write e to the i theta. Um, and so I want, uh, I want to look at a half plane, which is uh, bisected by this, by this direction. And so the kind of, uh, the kind of sectorial neighborhoods I'm considering are, are some kind of open, open sets like this. So this, this could be this is an example of a sectorial neighborhood for me. So uh, you could certainly think of just the usual sector. So uh, S could literally be 
something that looks like this. So a sector of uh, opening angle pi, so a half plane sector with some radius uh, epsilon or whatever. But actually in this business, uh, the, the kind of open neighborhoods, the kind of sectorial open neighborhoods that are more often encounter or somehow more natural are these things called um, Borel disks. So, so let's say this is, uh, again, this is my, the half plane uh, bisected by the direction theta. And so uh, if I look at this open disk like this, so it's just, uh, it's just kind of touching uh, the origin uh, here and with uh, full uh, pi opening. Uh, so in other words, I could say these are things like um, a set of h bar such that the real part of h bar to the minus one is bigger than some kind of uh, real number r. So this, this thing is called Borel disk. Uh, the reason these kind of things are more natural in this business is because uh, basically all the techniques uh, are based on the so-called Borel Laplace method. Um, which means the way I'm constructing, uh, I, I will describe how to construct a solution to this differential equation uh, with prescribed asymptotics. Uh, and the way the solution is constructed is by uh, uh, basically writing down a Laplace integral. And, uh, and Laplace integrals, uh, when, when something is defined as a Laplace integral, the, the natural domain of definition are precisely these kind of Borel, Borel disks. But anyway, the uh, S, um, in general, S can be any kind of open neighborhood like this, sectorial open neighborhood. Um, yeah, right. But I, wanted, I want to emphasize that um, the, the fact that the opening is uh, pi, so it's a half plane opening, is important. And that's basically where uh, uniqueness of a solution is going to be drawn from. I see, I think someone raised a hand, perhaps. Yeah, that was me. Sorry. So in yeah. this condition, the real part of it bar inverse, the theta is, is where? Theta, uh, theta is just, uh, sorry, yes, uh, this should be rotated. You're right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it should be, uh, let me just erase this. It should be uh, e to the i theta greater than r, I think, like this. Uh, so I just so it's so if you know if theta were zero, so we we were looking at uh, the real line, then what I wrote before would literally be uh, the shape that I drew. So you just need to rotate it. Um, anyway, so the point uh, the point of looking at uh, a sectorial neighborhood of h bar equal to zero is that now I I have a notion uh, of what it means to you know consider the limit as h bar goes to zero. So we have a notion h bar goes to zero, um, you know, in in the sector S. So uh, for the entirety of today, whenever I say uh, h bar goes to zero, I will always mean that it's uh, taken within that uh, specified sector. This is important because we are going to be doing asymptotic analysis, and asymptotics always depend on directionality. Um, and there's something important about this. Uh, uh, Nikita. Yeah. Uh, so you spoke about the Borel disk, but when you say sectorial neighborhood, do you think about the standard picture or the Borel disk? Any, any. So a Borel disk is a sectorial neighborhood. Uh, so is a sector. They're all, uh, they're all okay, examples okay. of sectorial so neighborhoods. All, okay, thank you. Yeah, by, so maybe the precise definition, uh, more geometric definition okay. is that you need to blow up uh, at the origin and then a sectorial neighborhood is something that whose closure in this blown up Riemann surface intersects uh, the, the circle, the blown up circle in an arc, in an open arc. That's the, that's the definition. Okay. Anyway, but they're, they're all examples. They're all examples of sectorial neighborhoods. Thank you. Right. So, um, right. So, there, so the really important thing about focusing on 
uh, you know, considering such a notion as uh, of h bar going to zero is that if you look at the Riccati equation, uh, the the only kind of you could say the difficult thing about the Riccati equation is the fact that well the fact that it's a differential equation, but the the differential equation aspect of it, as h bar goes to zero, uh, uh, goes to, kind of goes to zero with it because because the the differentiation is scaled by h bar. So if I if I literally set h bar equal to zero, uh, then my Riccati equation will degenerate from a differential equation to an algebraic equation. So in other words, I, you know, I started with a problem of solving a differential equation um, and I've degenerated it by taking this limit as h bar goes to zero, degenerated it to uh, a problem of a completely different uh, uh, manner, which is, a, it's an algebraic, it's an al algebraic equation. So this is a typical situation in singular perturbation theory that you, you have a family of problems. Here we have a family of problems depending on h bar. Uh, and there is a particular member of that family or, or some kind of degeneration of that family uh, where, uh, where, this, uh, where this member has a completely different uh, structure and completely different aspect. So the point of kind of, so, okay, so let, maybe let me write this down. I, I said too many things. So the point is that uh, the Riccati equation degenerates uh, as h bar goes to zero to an algebraic equation. And uh, the point is that this is a typical setting of singular perturbation theory. So in other words, uh, what I am trying to discuss today is uh, a, a, a problem in singular perturbation theory. And um, <clears throat> so the typical interest in singular perturbation theory is to start at this degenerate problem, which uh, usually is much simpler. So in our case, it is much simpler. It's an algebraic problem. Uh, solve the problem there, um, and then uh, expand uh, out of this degenerate uh, h-bar equal to zero fiber uh, into all h-bar. And uh, and deduce a solution to our original problem that way. So you, we kind of we degenerate to something that we can solve, solve it there, and then and then uh, degenerate back. Uh, and and so yeah, the, pro the the problem is that that is quite hard. Um, uh, right. Uh, okay, but there is something we can say about uh, an equation like this. So okay, Riccati equation is a very classical equation. It's been studied uh, for a very, very long time. And uh, the theory is very well known. In particular, um, the existence and uniqueness theory for a Riccati equation is well known, at least in the, in the, in the unperturbed case. So existence and uniqueness theory for the unperturbed Riccati equation is well known. So what I mean by unperturbed is uh, just that we don't care about the limit as h bar goes to zero. So we just, it can be a differential equation with a parameter, but we don't, um, I, I'm not worried about what happens as h bar goes to zero, or in fact, I could, uh, you know, h bar could in, in fact be a constant. So, uh, existing uniqueness theory for this is well developed, and you know, uh, the theorems are of the form that if you um, if you give uh, 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 an initial condition which is uh, somehow smooth uh, in the parameter h bar, then uh, locally, I can find a unique solution to my Riccati equation. And in fact, uh, so that's, that's like local, local existence and uniqueness theory. That's, that's pretty simple. Uh, the much harder problem is to try to extend this locally defined solution to a more, to a global solution, or at least uh, semi-global. That's much harder. That involves a lot of uh, basically an analytic continuation uh, methods. And that's, that's also 
uh, fairly well known. Um, and in, so Riccati equation in particular is a, a, a great equation because uh, what is known is that uh, the, uh, um, so <clears throat> there are two types of singularities in a differential equation, some, some which are called fixed, the ones that you can read off the coefficients themselves. So I, I assume that my coefficients are meromorphic uh, so they have singularity. So my solutions are necessarily going to be singular in some way, dictated by how singular my coefficients are. So those are those are fixed singularities. Uh, differential equations also have another type of singularity, which are much less tractable. They're called movable singularities. Those depend on initial conditions. And the great thing about the Riccati equation is that uh, movable singularities uh, are known to be only poles or or branch points. Anyway, I'm saying all this to kind of uh, just to expose you to the fact that uh, existence and uniqueness theory for differential equations, especially something like a Riccati equation, is well known. However, not uh, in the case of singular perturbation theory. So uh, usual existence and uniqueness theory, the thing that I just described, all that well-known stuff, doesn't tell you anything about uh, you know, suppose I have constructed this local unique solution. How does it behave as h bar goes to zero? So uh, ordinary theory says nothing about that. Um, so you could try to approach it another way, uh, which is to say, well, okay, suppose I fix some kind of data, asymptotic data as h bar goes to zero. Can I uh, use that as my initial condition somehow? Can I use that to construct a solution? And uh, so this, th these are the kind of results that I needed in my geometric problems, and I failed to find anywhere in the literature. It seems like a very classical problem, but uh, at least in general, there's no no uh, systematic satisfactory solution. So <clears throat> I had to basically do it myself. Um, okay, so uh, so let me just say this: existence uniqueness theory for the unperturbed Riccati equation is well known, but says nothing about um, about the behavior as h bar goes to zero, uh, behavior of the solution. Um, so so the question that uh, you could pose is uh, 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 if if we fix uh, some kind of asymptotic data uh, at h bar equal to zero, or as h bar goes to zero, can we uh, determine a unique, or, or, or at least some uh, kind of uh, solution with these asymptotics. Um, right. So, so this is the problem that I want to solve and describe uh, how it's solved. So let me make a couple of assumptions about my coefficients. So I'll assume basically two two main things. Uh, so first of all, something about the way my coefficients are meromorphic. Um, so of course, uh, they are uh, meromorphic coefficients in two variables. So the the polar, this, this, the set uh, where, where it develops poles is a hypersurface in X cross S. So the hypersurface, uh, let me call it maybe D, inside X cross S of uh, poles of my coefficients A, B, and C. So, um, you know, a priori, I'm just studying, uh, my problem is just over X cross S, where S is an open sector. So I could ask how this hypersurface behaves as H bar approaches the origin. Uh, and the, the condition that I want to impose is that it uh, approaches this uh, kind of central h bar equal to zero fiber in a in a transverse 
in a transverse manner. So, um, so the the hypersurface. Let me just say it like this: limits uh, as h bar goes to zero uh, in a transverse way. So picture. Uh, so if this is my x cross s space, uh, so this uh, this particular copy of x of my domain x is the one that's sitting above the vertex h bar equal to zero, and then. Um, so what I want is this D, this hypersurface D, well, you know, it could do all kinds of crazy stuff here. I don't really care about its behavior away. I'm not making any restrictions there, but the way it limits to this central fiber as H bar approaches zero, um, I want that to be happening in this kind of transverse way. So in particular, uh, I, I want to avoid situations where uh, you know D is maybe like tangent uh, to my central fiber. So that would be that would be an example of a, a something that doesn't approach in a transverse way. So th this assumption I don't think is very uh, significant or very uh, very restrictive. Uh, but anyway, it's, it certainly simplifies the analysis. Right. Uh, and it, excuse hmm? me. Can I? Uh... Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, um, it would be a completely different problem if uh, you didn't have this sort of behavior, because then you would be talking about confluence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no. So, uh, so well. Keep in mind that these uh, these components of D could have multiplicity. In fact, I want them to be. You know, the, uh, certainly they can have multiplicity. But so the, the complement doesn't change as you intersect H. You, that's right. Exactly. Right. That's so that's th why I'm saying that the situation mm -hmm. in which you have a change of multiplicity, or the fact that you have a tangency, uh, that would be a completely different problem. Yes. So it yeah. would be a problem in which then A of H bar and B of H bar and C of H bar. Uh, in the limit as h bar goes to zero would allow you to keep the differential equation. Yes, it's it's sim yes exactly. So it's difficult. It would be an algebraic equation. Uh, yeah. So I think so. Okay. Fr from the point of view of kind of analysis, forgetting about all this geometry, from the point of view of analysis, if you restrict to the this transversality assumption that I made, then basically you can prove the theorem that I'm about to state using. The kind of the simplest case of this Borel uh, Laplace resummation method, and if you uh, if you allow bad kind of tangency behavior like this, then uh, it seems to me that what you need to involve is uh, some kind of multi asymptotics, uh, multi summation techniques, which are much much harder. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, it, it, yes. Uh, maybe at some point it would be interesting for us to see examples. So those pictures are very nice, but I mean, just to, to understand what you have in mind, right? I guess at some point you show us what kind of examples with singular behavior you have, you so, have in mind, right? Uh, maybe one thing I could say, uh, actually, let me, let me tell you the second condition and then I will kind of translate this geometric picture into what happening in the second uh, in the second condition it'll and it'll become clearer I think so the second condition I want is uh, I want so let me go back to my equation so these uh, uh, so my Riccati equation has the coefficients a B and C and uh, you know a priori they're only defined in some uh, sectorial neighborhood which means I'm certainly not assuming that they are holomorphic or uh, or anything of the sort at h bar equal to zero. But I do want to be able to take their limits. In fact, I want to take their asymptotic expansions as h bar goes to zero. And that's really the, the assumption that I want. So, so the, uh, yeah, so the assumptions are, the, the assumptions on the behavior of a, b, and c as h bar goes to zero are pretty, uh, pretty general. Um, so the only thing that I want is that, so the coefficients a, b, c admit 
asymptotic expansions. These are asymptotic expansions with uh, meromorphic coefficients. So in other words, they are, uh, you could say they're in the elements in this ring, meromorphic functions on X, uh, which are, so a uh, formal power series in H bar whose coefficients are meromorphic functions of X. So in other words, uh, they look like this, a N X H bar to the N. Uh, and this thing, these are some meromorphic functions on X. Um, right. So, so I want I want to assume that they admit asymptotic expansions, and then uh, so asymptotic expansions as H bar goes to zero in this sector S, in the sectorial sector sectorial neighborhood S, and then um, I want to in order to make some analysis work out, you want to assume a little bit more, which is some kind of regularity on uh, on these asymptotic expansions. So with uh, some regularity. And I will, uh, this is not so crucial. I will maybe describe it more precisely later. Um, so, <clears throat> So to translate, to basically to answer Anton's uh, request uh, and translate uh, kind of the meaning of this transversality uh, assumption on the polar uh, locus, um, what I want, so one plus two, it's not equivalent to this, but it implies uh, an important thing, which is that uh, orders of poles of the leading order coefficients, A0, B0, C0, dominate uh, all the subsequent od orders. In other words, A, uh, so in other words, you know, if, if um, X0, is in D intersected with H bar equal to zero is a, a or, or let me write it like this. So D, so IE, uh, D locally, let's say, uh, let's say around this point here, locally can be described as an equation X minus X zero, where this point is X zero maybe to some power m, so that would be the multiplicity or the order of the pole of my equation, times h bar is equal to zero. So if you're, uh, if you're an algebraic geometer, this, this just means that I want, if, you know, if my family existed in the usual sense over the central fiber, then I would say that this is a normal crossings uh, divisor, divisor with normal crossings. Here I need to be a little bit careful because I'm doing some kind of limiting procedure. Um, but that's it. So, uh, and what this, what this also means is that, uh, so that's number one and number two is uh, uh, if, uh, or, or maybe like this. Um, uh, for, for any K, so at any order in H bar, a, the kth coefficient, uh, if I, if I multiply it by x to the minus x zero to the m, uh, uh, sorry, let me write it like this. So if, if a zero at x, of x uh, goes like x to the minus x to the uh, sorry x minus x zero to some power m uh, as x goes to x zero. So if we go into the pole uh, with a minus, then uh, for every for every uh, for every k. Um, 
for every k, uh, the kth coefficient in a uh, is no more singular than the mth power. So, so that's what I mean by orders of the poles being dominated in the leading order. So this, this follows from this transversality assumption on the, on the divisor or on the uh, singular locus. Okay, any, any more questions about this? So these are basically just some assumptions on the coefficients. Right. Okay, so, um, so the fact that I can take asymptotic expansions in particular means that I can look at the leading order of my equation. So basically just setting h bar to zero or taking the limit as h bar goes to zero. That brings me to a leading order equation. So that's the most degenerate uh, part of my singular perturbation theory problem. Um, so just the h bar equal to zero order of my Riccati equation is, so the left-hand side where I have the differentiation multiplied by h bar, that of course in the limit as h bar goes to zero uh, vanishes. And then the right-hand side just becomes a polynomial in some, uh, in, in f zero which obviously has uh, two distinct roots. Whenever the discriminant uh, is non-zero, it's two distinct roots. Whenever, uh, whenever the leading order discriminant Uh, delta naught, which is B0 squared minus 4A0 C0 is non-zero. And somehow this, this quantity, this leading order discriminant plays an absolutely crucial role in, uh, in all of the analysis. So in particular, uh, the zeros of the discriminant uh, are called turning points And these are precisely the points which you want to avoid, like the plague or like the coronavirus. Um, <laughs> um, so somehow all the analysis always breaks down at the turning points. So uh, the terminology comes from um, the study of the Schrodinger equation, in particular from the WKB analysis. Uh, and that, that is also where Turning points are precisely where WKB analysis basically, w, WKB approximation breaks down and uh, where, uh, you know, people over the century, not centuries, over the decades have been uh, posing problems of uh, like connection problems and trying to match the asymptotics. So all of that has to do with uh, turning points. Okay, so... Um, so, uh, so this is page what five. Um, <clears throat> so let uh, if I look at a simply connected set uh, where the discriminant is non-zero. Uh, so simply connected. Uh, simply connected. Uh, domain such that the discriminant is non-zero, then um, I can globally on U choose two distinct solutions, leading order solutions, two distinct univalued, uh, but possibly meromorphic, distinct uh, meromorphic solutions or leading order solutions. Um, on U, so, uh, you know, you could denote them F0 plus minus depending on the choice uh, of the square root. 
of the discriminant, which I can do because uh, U doesn't contain any zeros and it's simply connected. Um, then uh, the point is that once I restrict myself to U, um, then the Riccati equation is very easy to solve formally in power series uh, in H bar. It's easy to solve formally. So um, in particular, uh, you could say this is a kind of formal existence and uniqueness theorem, which is uh, very well known, uh, very simple. So on U, uh, if I fix one of the two leading order solutions, F0, let's say F0 uh, hash is F0 zero plus or F zero minus, either one, just fix one. Then the statement is that there exists a unique formal solution F hat. So this is a formal power series in H bar, uh, where the coefficients again are meromorphic functions on U. Um, so it's, uh, uh, there certainly exists one like this, and it's unique, uh, fixed by the fact that its leading order should be the one we fixed earlier. Um, so this is, this is pretty simple. You just expand, you just look at your Riccati equation, you expand it order by order in H bar, and you find that uh, you actually end up solving not differential equations uh, at all anymore. Instead, it's just a, an infinite tower of linear algebraic equations. Um, and the fact that the discriminant doesn't vanish means that at every order in H bar, I'm able to solve it uniquely for, uh, for the coefficient fk at that order. And so I just do this, uh, you get a kind of a recursive definition um, and it's uniquely fixed. Um, so what you should think is that... Can I a question? Yeah. Uh, don't you get a constant at every step that you can uh, You get a... No, no, because it's, because it's literally a linear... It's not a differential equation. It's a linear, uh, uh, like... Um, it's, a, it's an algebraic equation. Nikita? Can't I... V yeah. Would it be useful to say that actually the derivative doesn't disappear, but uh, it enters, so to say, now in the right-hand side, right? So you right. determine the order n, and the derivative of the order n minus 1 participates. That's right. Yeah, so, you did, you, so F0, I, I mean, I already solved it because I looked at the leading order equation, and I chose this solution. So this was this F uh, hash for me, F0 hash for me. Now, to solve for F1, I look at the first order uh, of my Riccati equation. And what I find is that the, uh, the derivative term is just the derivative of F0. So that's, that's already known data for me. So F1 is solved in terms of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm just confused because it seems like I could uh, take a, a power series in H bar that has con uh, coefficient, constant coefficient one and multiply your F hat by that and I would still get a solution. So um, what you need to do is you need to look at the Riccati equation and expand it order by order. And you will see that once you fix the leading order solution, F0, everything else is uniquely fixed. There's a, so every subsequent equation has a unique solution. Okay. You, just, you just need to write it down and look at the, yeah, they're, they're very simple equations. Um, right. OK, so what you should think here is that I, I looked at, uh, so let me write down my Riccati equation again. So I had h bar d by dx uh, f is equal to, uh, what was it, a f squared plus b f plus c f. So this was my Riccati equation. What you should think is that I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to derive a, a solution to this uh, Riccati equation by looking 
uh, by first solving it asymptotically, which means... Uh, um, uh, excuse me, Nikita, yeah. just, just, I, I think it's just C, right? If I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, yes, I'm yes, sorry. Thank you. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I look at the asymptotic version, uh, the corresponding asymptotic version of this equation where I substitute every single element in this equation by its asymptotic expansion. So I'm looking at this formal differential equation So all of these, so this is a, uh, an equation for uh, power series, formal power series in H-bar with meromorphic coefficients. What I'm doing is I'm solving this. Uh, so, you know, as long as the discriminant is non-vanishing, I'm able to, you, to choose a univalued uh, square root of the discriminant, I'm, uh, I can solve this. Uh, and so what I should be thinking is that, well, I found not quite the solution to the Riccati equation itself, but I found the asymptotic expansion to what would be a solution of the Riccati equation. Um, and now the idea is, well, uh, can I construct uh, an actual solution, an analytic solution to my Riccati equation uh, whose asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to zero is the one I just fixed. So that's, that's the question. Um, so let me write this down maybe as a, as a theorem. Uh, it's, uh, I'll keep it uh, as a rough statement. Um, so you could say that this is like asymptotic, H bar asymptotic uh, existence and uniqueness theorem. Um, so rough. Um, so the statement goes like this. So let U as before. So U uh, is a simply connected domain where the discriminant, the leading order discriminant is non-vanishing. So what I need to fix, uh, I just need to fix one of the two branches of the square root of delta naught. So fix square root delta naught on U and uh, let F, uh, F hat be, uh, you know, the corresponding uniquely determined, oops, uniquely determined uh, formal solution. So in other words, i.e. It's, it's the one uh, that satisfies uh, square root delta naught is B0 plus 2A0 F0. Just that one. So <clears throat> uh, the next thing is I need to assume something about the geometry of uh, my open set U. So this is where th uh, the fact that this is a singular perturbation theory problem, uh, the, by nature, the semi-global geometry of uh, your problem begins to play a very significant role. Uh, somehow you, you can't get away with just local statements. You need to know something uh, a little bit, uh, not necessarily completely global, but maybe semi-global. Um, so I'll assume the following. So, the, so my open set U, um, I can, if I have a vector field on X, I can flow that open set U by this vector field. So I have, I have a, a, a very specific particular vector field in mind, which I will want to use to define a flow. So I will say the, the forward, forward flow of U by the vector field Um, so the vector field is given as follows. So it's, ju it's, uh, it's just, of course, d by dx, uh, but then it's scaled by uh, one over square root discriminant. Um, and in fact, I also want to multiply it by the phase. This is the same phase that bisects the sectorial neighborhood. And so this is a, uh, well, potentially some kind of meromorphic or uh, 
but at, at least away from poles and, ze uh, and zeros of uh, delta naught. This is a holomorphic vector field. Um, so I will take its real part. So this is the this this is now a real vector field on a two-dimensional real two-dimensional complex plane. Um, and so I want to flow my open set U uh, by this vector field. Um, and uh, the requirement is that I want this flow to be complete. So in other words, okay, so here's a picture. Uh, so here's my open set U. Um, and then every point in uh, this open set, I can, uh, you know, it lies on an integral curve. I, I am assuming that it lies on an integral curve of this uh, vector field, which I can now flow. So I flow it forward. Forward here makes sense because this is a real vector field. And so I, I'm what I need to assume is that the forward flow uh, of this open set is, uh, is complete. So I can flow it for infinite time. So the picture is like this, and maybe I can denote this forward flow by u plus or something like that. Um, so maybe maybe some words could help here. Um, uh, this this vector field, I want to um, it's it's related, uh, or maybe in fact is the same thing as the Liouville vector field. And so. Um, Perhaps this is a slightly loose terminology, but it's certainly related to uh, Louisville flow that you get in classical mechanics. Um, right. Uh, so is there anything else? Are there any questions about this? Uh, this is a just a geometric assumption that I need to be able to flow uh, this. Thing. Basically, the reason I need to do this is the way I'm going to construct a solution. The, uh, the way the solution is constructed is that uh, you... Um, you um, you integrate something along the flow lines. You you uh, you basically design a simple, relatively simple looking integral kernel, which you then integrate along the flow lines of this vector field. And you need to be Nikita? able to do that. Yes. Yeah. Just a question. Uh, how restrictive is this condition? From the way you describe it, it's a little bit difficult to grasp. Mm -hmm. Is it like very difficult to satisfy, or it's almost always satisfied? So what about that? So, uh, so for example, in the in the particular case, if you're studying, um, let's say let's say you're studying, I'll get to this, but let's say you're studying the WKB analysis of a Schrodinger equation. Uh, this flow would be the one coming from the foliation of the corresponding quadratic differential, and uh, so the condition here uh, is um, uh, the space of quadratic differentials having such complete flows is dense in the in all of in the space of all quadratic differentials. So this is, as, as, uh, if, yeah, if you're if you're trying to, uh, if you're looking at the space of quadratic differentials for which you can uh, you know apply basically this theorem, then it's an open dense uh, subset. Um, so yeah, the, the crucial assumption here is that. Uh, U doesn't contain turning points, so U is turning point free. Um, and moreover, uh, the, this uh, forward flow U plus also doesn't contain turning points. So, like a, t a typical case in which uh, you know this flow would fail to be complete is if I, I take a point uh, in my open set U and I uh, start flowing it and it flows into uh, the zero of the discriminant, into a turning point. Mm -hmm. Then okay. the flow is not complete. So, so that's, basically, uh, that, that's basically the assumption. The assumption is that um, my open set U, if I flow it forward, I don't hit any turning points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more technical thing. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be okay maybe like finish the formulation of the theorem and then have a break? Is yep, it a good absolutely. point? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was planning, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so, right. More question? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, okay, there is, there is a question. <laughs> okay. Dylan, Dylan? Hi, yes. Um, can you hear Hi, Dylan. Me? Yes. Okay, I, I see that you, uh, you allow um, 
so, so you, you, you're saying uh, something about asymptotic expansions of the coefficients in Riccati's equation, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Oops. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Um, is your result strictly stronger than the uh, koika shafke result in that I think in that result, yes. uh, those coefficients are required to in fact be polynomials in H-bar? That's correct. Well, so, uh, I mean, I was going to make a comment on that. Uh, one comment is that, um, so there is a result which I'm going to state, uh, I guess, after the break, um, which is usually attributed to Koeke Shafke, but the, prob the big problem with that result is that the proof is uh, somehow unavailable. Uh, it's, it's not published anywhere, so no, no one has seen, I, I, even I haven't seen the proof. Um, so, but th there is a theorem uh, about uh, summability of uh, WKB solutions uh, uh, and ultimately about basically solving the singularly perturbed Riccati equation, which is often attributed to uh, to Koike Shafke. So uh, whatever th that result is, it's true. What I'm claiming here is much stronger uh, because I am allowing the coefficients uh, to be, uh, to just um, to, to just admit an asymptotic expansion in H-bar with a certain regularity. They don't need to be, they don't even need to be holomorphic at H-bar equal to zero. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So these are basically all the assumptions. Uh, then the conclusion, uh, the conclusion is that um, basically I can, once I fixed this formal solution F hat, then on U I can, I can uh, write down an actual analytic or meromorphic solution F uh, whose asymptotic expansion as H bar goes to zero is this fixed uh, asymptotic is this fixed formal solution f hat so uh so to be more precise so there is uh a sub sectorial neighborhood s prime of s and crucially which has the same opening so it's still basically like a half plane subsector so maybe just the radius is smaller uh, radius, uh, either you can think of the sector or a Borel disk. Uh, in this case, Borel disk is the more appropriate thing. So just the radius of the Borel disk is a bit smaller than the one I started with, uh, potentially. So, um, so there's a subsectorial neighborhood S prime of S with the same opening uh, such that on uh, this product space U cross S prime, there exists a unique meromorphic solution F, still a function of course of X and H bar, uh, such that if I, uh, such that it admits an asymptotic expansion as H bar goes to zero and its asymptotic expansion is precisely uh, this uh, formal solution F hat that I solved for using just simple linear algebra. So as H bar goes to zero. Um, and then maybe uh, a, a moreover, which will be a bit more vague, which, uh, which is, so I can say something more about this asymptotic relationship and, and in fact about the expression for the solution F. Uh, so first of all, this Asymptotic relationship between f and f hat holds with uh, the same asymptotic regularity as my assumption on the coefficients, with the same asymptotic regularity as you know a asymptotic to a hat, b asymptotic to b hat, and so on. Um, so I'm sort of, uh, you can think of this as, uh, as if I'm starting with an equation in a certain analytic class, asymptotic analytic class, and I derive a solution within the same analytic class. So that's kind of a nice, nice thing. And the other thing is that, and, uh, 
So maybe maybe let me write it on the next page. Uh, so and f is a uh, rather has a rather explicit expression. So f can be expressed uh, explicitly as a Laplace transform of something. So uh, what that means is that the way f is defined is basically f, uh, the, the leading order f0, plus uh, an integral of Laplace form, which is a, uh, an integral of, that looks like this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an integration uh, along a ray, infinite ray from the origin in the direction theta. Um, the integration variable is psi. And you're integrating something that looks like this, where where this phi is um, defined uh, by a recursion. So you have a recursive, long recursive formula, explicit in terms of the coefficients. So recursion in terms of coefficients a, b, and c. Um, and um, maybe just one last thing to say before the break. Um, the, uh, for those who are familiar with Borel-Laplace method, this phi is nothing but the Borel transform of f hat, the asymptotic expansion of f, uh, analytically continued uh, along a ray. Okay, so maybe, maybe I can pause here. Yeah, so probably it's a good time to start again. It's 4.10. So welcome back, everybody, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's continue. Okay, excellent. Um, so, are there any? Does anyone have any questions about what I uh, what I said before? Uh, I actually do have a rather yeah. naive question, but I, I, you don't need to answer it now. <laughs> so, uh, it would be interesting if at some point you could comment on what happens when you do run into those turning points. Probably something interesting happens may be very complicated but that, that's that's a naive question so i definitely won't be able to comment on it today uh so that yeah that kind of requires a different kind of analysis uh, altogether so yeah basically turning points are hard to deal with i think i have some uh forming idea of what's going on and how to describe it but certainly nothing i can explain very well right now <laughs> yeah but uh, actually actually one thing i can't say um which is that this function f um at a turning at a simple turning point so uh, a point where my discriminant uh vanishes to uh to order one um so uh, simple zeros of the discriminant. At those points, uh, this solution f, the way I wrote it down just here, uh, I think uh, I'm not 100% confident about what I'm saying, but I think what, what I'm seeing is that I'm, I'm able to uh, directly see a pole in f. So f has a pole there. And in fact, the, uh, I'm also able to deduce the fact that f has a, um, uh, sorry, it doesn't have a pole. It has a branch singularity there. So it, it behaves like a square root. Uh, at that point, I think I think that's true, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this this part is yet okay. to be completely okay. fleshed. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Okay, so in, um, maybe instead of describing the proof in uh, much detail, let me just uh, describe some kind of uh, results and motivation behind. Uh, I ask you just something uh, yep. very basic. So yep. um, we can always linearize the Riccati equation. No, uh, you have a transformation to take, uh, which, in which you express it as the ratio of uh, two solutions of a linear differential equation of second order. Mm -hmm. And for the linear differential equations of second order, we know a lot. Right. So is your proof relying on that or is it a direct proof? It's a direct proof. Okay. It's a direct proof, yeah. 
basically the way the way it's proved let me let me just mention it in two words now and maybe i can describe it in more detail later the way the way this works is uh i i look at the formal riccati equation so the one that i you get from asymptotics um, and you apply the Borel transform to it, which is basically inverse Laplace transform. Um, and then, uh, thanks to the asymptotic assumptions that I made on my coefficients, uh, that gives me an equation, a differential equation for uh, germs uh, in the new uh, Borel variable. And then, basically, the idea is to take that germ, analytically continue it, and uh, along the real line and take the Laplace transform. So it's a, it's a, it's a complete direct, completely direct proof. Um, but it is, of course, related, like you said, uh, to second order differential equations. And that's actually what I want to describe now. So that's one of the main motivation, main sources of motivation for me. Um, actually, the Riccati equation is kind of an incredible equation. I mean, I, when I was writing this paper, I'm still writing it, but I, I kind of at first thought maybe I should do uh, some kind of literature review. Uh, and so I started looking at, you know, situations where Riccati equation appears and the literature is just, it's infinite. It's, it's infinite amount of literature and the, the kind of things that Riccati equation is used is staggering. It's, it goes from like optimal control theory to uh, dynamic programming uh, to you know something close closer to home projective differential geometry um, to um, the quantum mechanics of Schrodinger equation and then all the way to uh, like algebraic geometry of meromorphic connections and the, and the last two things that I mentioned are the main sources of motivation for me so uh, so in particular let me let me talk about the WKB analysis um, so motivation and consequences. So uh, this part, I particularly want to make sure that I describe because um, as some of you know, there's kind of been a lot of confusion in the, uh, in the field about uh, some results uh, about the existence of certain, what I call WKB, exact WKB solutions to the Schrodinger equation. So, so basically I want to uh, as a, uh, I want, I'm deriving that as a consequence of this asymptotic existence theorem that I just stated uh, to kind of put some solidity uh, in, these, uh, in these results. So number one, so exact WKB analysis. So, uh, so what is exact WKB analysis about? Let me just very quickly run over it. Um, so you consider a Schrodinger equation. So that's one dimensional uh, time independent Schrodinger equation in the complex domain. So that thing looks like this second derivative multiplied by uh, the perturbation parameter squared, h bar squared minus q, which is often known as the potential. And uh, so we're looking at a differential equation like this. So let me call it Schro. Um, so uh, the potential Q normally, uh, normally it's in fact completely independent of H bar or kind of at worst, uh, what people consider is uh, maybe polynomial in H bar. Uh, but uh, but for us uh, it can be kind of completely uh, completely general. So as long as it has uh, an asymptotic expansion in some direction in H bar, then uh, then we're good. So but for us uh, enough to just have an asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to zero in some in some sectorial neighborhood. Again, I want to uh, make sure that that sectorial neighborhood is uh, like a half half plane contained in a half plane. Okay, so the way WKB analysis proceeds is that so we have this differential equation, uh, second order linear differential equation. We're going to uh, 
search for a solution in a, in a particular exponential form. So this is called the WKB ANSATS. ANSATS. So search for a solution in the form, so psi of x h bar is going to be an exponential function. Uh, there's h bar inverse in the exponential. And then I'm going to integrate, I'm going to choose some base point x star, and I'm going to integrate some function of x and h bar, like this. So I, 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 posit, I posit that my solution has this form. Um, so I sub this into the Schrodinger equation. And after computing a few derivatives um, and canceling out psi, I find that if, if, this expression, if this expression psi is to be a solution to the Schrodinger equation, then this uh, function f must be a solution of a Riccati equation. So get a Riccati equation for f. And this Riccati equation has uh, a much simpler form uh, than what we saw before. So it's, it just looks like this. Um, so in particular, you know, the leading, leading order equation is, uh, is nothing but f squared is equal to q naught, q naught being the leading order of q. Um, and, uh, and so the zeros of q naught, which are the zeros of the potential, are the turning points. Um, Maybe let me say more generally, actually I can do uh, the same thing had I started with uh, not just a Schrodinger equation, but any second order singularly perturbed ODE. So more generally, given any uh, you know, second order singularly perturbed uh, ODE, so by that I mean anything that looks like this, h bar squared d by dx squared minus p x h bar h bar d by dx minus q x h bar, all of that attempting to kill psi like this, where again uh, the coefficients p and q uh, could be, you know, the meromorphic functions in x and h bar, and just have uh, some kind of fixed asymptotic regularity as h bar goes to zero. Then um, again, using the same trick, if I if I posit that my solution should have uh, this exponential form, this WKB ansatz uh, formula, then get a, a Riccati equation for f, uh, which just looks like this. Uh, plus p f plus q. Right. Okay. So. Uh, so let's go to the next page. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm if I'm on any simply connected uh, domain on any simply connected domain u, uh, which, which doesn't contain any turning points, then um, just as before, I get uh, two unique formal solutions, f hat, uh, let's call them plus minus, again, depending on the choice of the square root of q naught or the choice of the square root of uh, the discriminant for the more general ODE. 
Um, so I get, I get two of these formal solutions. Um, and what people normally call uh, formal WKB solutions are simply uh, formal solutions to my Schrodinger equation or my second order, more general second order ODE, uh, which have this form. So I literally just, where I had F, I'll, I'll put in F hat. Um, F plus minus hat X H bar DX. The meaning of integration here is, uh, so this, is, uh, this F hat is a formal power series in H bar. Uh, so the meaning of integration here is that I'm, I'm integrating term by term. So I'm just exchanging summation and integration. Um, and then what, what, uh, people normally call uh, exact WKB solution is any uh, actual analytic solution which has which has this uh, expression as a, an asymptotic exp or which is asymptotic to this expression. So exact WKB solution is any uh, analytic solution psi x h bar, uh, you know, possibly singular in the sense that it could have maybe meromorphic singularities or essential singularities, whatever. But the point is that it, uh, as a function of h bar, it's, it's, um, uh, it has domains where it is analytic, which is uh, asymptotic to a formal WKB solution as h bar goes to zero. Again, remaining in the same sector. Um, so as a, right. So, so the purpose of WKB normally is you start, uh, let's go back to, uh, oops, not this. Let's say, uh, yeah. So uh, suppose you, you are studying the Schrodinger equation, you substitute uh, the WKB ansatz, and so you boil down your problem to solving this kind of Riccati equation. Um, and uh, being a problem in singular perturbation theory, what you do is you first solve it formally, and then hope uh, that maybe you can come up with an actual solution which has this as as is asymptotics. So that problem has been unsolved. Uh, so normally, what you know about WKB analysis is what is called the WKB approximation which is that uh, you, so you find a formal solution to this Riccati equation. Uh, that's a formal power series in H-bar and you take a truncation. So normally people take the first two terms um, and that gives you, uh, so, right, and you, and you plug that in to this expression. So now that uh, is some exponential uh, to an actual uh, analytic function. So it's an, a an actual analytic solution, uh, sorry, an actual analytic uh, expression, uh, but it's not a solution. It's an, it's an approximation to a solution. Um, and then, of course, you can study how well it approximates it, uh, the error term, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, however, the, uh, the point of exact uh, singular perturbation theory is that uh, I'm not going to do any approximate analysis. Instead, I'm going to try to find uh, a true solution uh, which admits an asymptotic expansion, and that asymptotic expansion is the formal solution that I just deduced. Um, so, um, so that's so that's the point of uh, kind of exact WKB analysis. So, um, because uh, now I have this uh, asymptotic existence uniqueness theorem uh, for the Riccati equation, um, I have as a consequence something I can say about um, such exact, about the existence of such exact WKB solutions. So, so consider, uh, maybe let me write it actually here. Oops. Uh, I'll need more space. So consider uh, either the Schrodinger equation or maybe more generally uh, this second order ODE, this more general second order ODE, where is it? Sorry, uh, this one. Um, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on, uh, again, a simply connected 
uh, domain, which is um, which satisfies two properties just as before, or very similar to, to what we had before. So first, I want it to be uh, turning point free. And second, it's a uh, Luvial flow, you know, uh, again, with that phase theta, or theta, maybe theta Luvial flow, this time in both directions. So uh, U is a simply connected domain. I have two branches of the square root of the potential or the discriminant. So I can flow uh, in one direction and in another direction. So I want, uh, for this theorem, I want both directions uh, to be complete, the flow to be complete. So flow in both directions, in both directions is complete. So again, that just means that um, I don't, as I flow the points in U, I don't hit any turning points. Um, or again, to maybe to give uh, a more familiar picture from WK, so those of you who are familiar with WKB, um, what are important in WKB are the, uh, the Stokes domains. So they usually look like diamonds uh, with two turning points and two, um, two poles. So there's two turning points in the boundary and two poles. And then um, the foliation given by, you know, the quadratic differential that comes from your Schrodinger equation uh, is a foliation that uh, has leaves that go from one pole to another, like this. Um, so U, so this would be an example of U. This is uh, complete under the Louisville flow in both directions. Um, so the only thing I need to fix then is uh, I need to fix a base point. And then once I fix the base point, that determines for me a particular pair of uh, formal WKB solutions. So if I go back to this formula, it's sim simply by this formula. Uh, the only choice involved in writing down this formula is the choice of the base point. So once I've chosen the base point, uh, I can write down, uh, oops, sorry, maybe uh, where's the formal? Oh, here, uh, this, this, this is the formula that I wanted. So uh, once I fix a base point X star, this formula determines two specific uh, formal solutions, formal WKB solutions for me. So let, let's call them psi plus minus be the corresponding pair of formal WKB solutions. Um, right, uh, I think that's all I want. Yeah, so then the conclusion is that um, there is a sectorial neighborhood S sectorial neighborhood of H bar equal to zero. Again, with a half plane opening. So the same opening such that uh, um, on this open set U cross S, there exists a unique basis of exact WKB solutions. Uh, let me call them Psi plus minus. Uh, where the uniqueness is fixed by the asymptotics. So they're asymptotic to the pair of uh, formal WKB solutions. So H bar goes to zero in S. Uh, moreover, um, I can say something about uh, dominance relationship of these, uh, of these exact WKB solutions as I approach the poles. So if I parallel transport 
So parallel transporting these two solutions, psi plus minus, along the alluvial flow lines. So for example, in this picture, if I, uh, if I uh, choose this basis of solutions psi plus minus, and I parallel transport them into the pole along one of these, uh, one of these flow lines, then uh, they satisfy dominance relation. So one of these solutions is necessarily going to be, so for example, in the SL2 case, if, this, if I'm studying an actual Schrodinger equation, um, if I take this basis psi plus minus, and I parallel transport it into this pole, one of the solutions is going to be the subdominant decaying solution. The other one is going to be crazy, not uh, linearly independent. And if I parallel transport in the opposite direction, so I go to the other pole, then the dominance relation will reverse. Um, so uh, psi plus is dominant over psi minus, and you know at at one end and psi minus dominant over psi plus at the other. So basically the, the idea is that uh, I, so I, I fix this picture U, so this is my Stokes, let's say Stokes domain with these two poles in the boundary. Um, uh, because this domain doesn't contain any turning points, I fixed two square roots of the discriminant or in other words, uh, for, for a Schrodinger equation, two square roots of the potential. That determined to me a pair of exact WKB solutions. Um, and then uh, the theorem is that there exist, sorry, sorry, that determined for me a pair of formal WKB solutions on this open set U. Um, they're linearly independent, so they're a formal basis, if you like. Um, the statement is that there exists an actual basis of solutions, psi plus minus, on this open set U, such that one of the solutions is the subdominant solution as I approach one pole, and the other solution is the subdominant solution as, the, as I approach the other pole. Um, Could I ask you something? Yeah. Um, so uh, does, your, does your theorem allow for the possibility that the Schrodinger equation has apparent singularities? Yes, I think so, yeah. Uh, in, that, in that case, would your, would your solutions actually be holomorphic in that horizontal strip that you drew? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's in correct. the entire strip, really? Yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. The, the thing is that, uh, so apparent singularities actually don't... Um, so, so you see, apparent singularities, from the point of view of the Riccati equation, are just places where the leading coefficient, in, so the coefficient in front of f squared, vanishes. So uh, basically, you you just need to solve. So if you solve, if you try to put your Riccati equation where the leading coefficient has some zeros in this Stokes domain, if you want to. Uh, you know, before solving it, if you want to put it in the more standard form where the leading coefficient is one, so you kind of want to make it monic, then uh, then you're going to run into problems which are precisely the apparent singularities. Uh, but but the point is that you don't have to do that. Uh, even though the leading coefficient will vanish, the solution uh, has it has no effect on the solution. It just uh, the transformation from that solution to a solution which you would have gotten if you put your Riccati equation in the monic form, that gauge transformation, this would be a gauge transformation, that gauge transformation would be singular. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, not, not, not entirely, but you answered my question anyway. Right. Okay, any other, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so... Um, so I want to mention just another application of this very briefly. But before I do that, I want to make a comment about this theorem. So this theorem is a bit, um, so uh, uh, maybe a much weaker or a weaker version of this theorem is often attributed to Koike and Schafke. Uh, they have a, they, uh, they proved a statement about uh, uh, summability, Borel summability of uh, formal WKB solutions. 
Um, so I just want to make two comments. One, which is um, the the statement that is usually attributed to uh, to Kawiki and Shafke uh, is a special case of what I, uh, what I described. So what I described is uh, much more general, uh, in particular because of the kind of potentials I, I allow, and also because uh, I can do second order ODEs that are not necessarily Schrodinger equations. Um, uh, yeah, and, and then the second comment that I want to make is that, so although that theorem is usually attributed to Koyika Shafke, the, the proof is actually unavailable because they never published the paper. So, uh, so now at least I kind of just want to advertise uh, the preprint that is already out and this preprint, which should be out relatively soon, that at least now if you are wondering about how Koyika Shafke's result can be proved, there is a there would be a reference for it, which which would be one of the preprints that I'll put out. Um, yeah. Any any questions? Okay. Is your proof the same method? I don't. I don't know because I don't know. Uh, so I I think probably yes. So what I know of uh, Koike Shafke's method is that they use some kind of fixed point. The Banach thing, it's, it's fixed point the, theory. So, so you take you should take the some functional equation for solutions of the Riccati equation, and then after applying Borel transform, it becomes a partial differential equation, which you solve yeah. by fixed point. Yeah. So, so I I kind of my my proof is a lot more naive or or pedestrian, where I just kind of construct. Uh, I I do method of uh, successive approximations. So indeed, I. I, uh, no, actually, actually, that is. The, I, I think that is something that they do. Uh, the, the the fixed point uh, thing was, was done in a in a kind of uh, d a, a, another paper by Takei. I see. Which proves this result in some much more limited uh, generality. Wait, so have you? So you have seen the proof? There is. A, yeah. There is. Like, it's is it available somewhere? Yeah, all the Japanese uh, people who work on this have have seen it. <laughs> okay. That but excludes not, me. It wasn't, it wasn't available <laughs> in English. I see. I see. How do you know it then? Do you speak Japanese, Dylan? Uh, no, I, 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 it's a secret how I know it. I, I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I, but I have seen it. <laughs> okay, well... Oh, this is an open community. How can people have secrets? What about <laughs> open access? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, okay, in any event, if that exists, great, uh, but you can also look at my preprint. <laughs> um, right, okay, any, any other questions? So for those of us who are not Japanese, uh, I guess this, this should suffice. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to very briefly mention uh, another major source of motivation for me, this one, in much more uh, vague terms, and then maybe just give uh, like a three, four line outline of how, how the thing is actually constructed. So the other source of motivation for me is what I call uh, singularly uh, perturbed Levelt filtrations. So this, let me just, most of it I'll say in just in words. Um, to save some time. So you can think of this as a kind of generalization, generalization of WKB from, well, first of all, from Schrodinger equations uh, to general second order ODEs, which I already described in, on, you know, on the previous slide, uh, to altogether to systems. So it's true that uh, second order ODEs can always be written as systems and many systems can be written as second order ODEs, uh, but uh, not, not all of them. Uh, a gauge transformation that would, if, if you start with a system, a second order, a, a rank two system, if you want to put it in what is known as upper form, so write it down as a second order ODE, that requires a gauge transformation, which may or may not exist or may or may not be singular. Uh, so systems are, genuinely more general than uh, second order ODEs. Um, so WKB2 systems, rank two systems, and in fact, more generally to meromorphic connections, rank two meromorphic connections on holomorphic vector bundles. 
but as I said, uh, this talk is supposed to be mostly analytic. I don't want to really use many of those words. Um, so what I'm thinking of is, uh, so you consider a, a system, so a singularly perturbed rank two system of ODEs. So that's a thing that looks like this. Where A, um, where A is a two by two matrix uh, whose coefficients are meromorphic. So A is two by two with meromorphic coefficients, again, on a domain of you know, a very similar shape X cross S, S being some kind of sectorial neighborhood of opening, a half plane opening. And uh, all I want to require is that uh, the behavior of A in H bar is, uh, you know, of course it could be constant, it could be holomorphic at H bar equal to zero, but uh, most generally I just needed to admit uh, an asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to zero. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, again, here I will have to focus on subsets of x, which have some nice properties. In particular, I want to avoid turning points. What are turning points in this, uh, in this situation? So uh, I will compute. So a is a matrix, and it has a characteristic polynomial. Um, uh, and if I look at the leading order in h bar of a, uh, then that has a characteristic polynomial. So let me call that chi. So characteristic polynomial of the leading order of A. So because I've assumed that A admits an asymptotic expansion, A0 is, is well-defined uh, with meromorphic coefficients on, on X. Um, and then delta naught, what replaces delta naught is just the discriminant of chi. Discriminant of the characteristic polynomial. Um, so that gives me all the notions as before, turning points, in particular turning points, and, uh, and the Louisville flow. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so to make a long story short, <clears throat> uh, the, the generalization of WKB to this case of uh, the situation of systems or more general meromorphic connections is something about uh, filtrations by dominance rates uh, of my system. Um, so uh, let's see how much do I want to say. Um, so let, let me maybe let me write it like this. So let P be a pole of A of the leading order A, and let lambda plus minus be the eigenvalues of uh, the principal part or the leading order principal part, principal part, um, which I arrange. So I'm assuming that I can arrange them by their real parts. And let's say this is how I arrange them. Um, so so if, if U is, uh, again, simply connected turning point free with, uh, you know, complete, uh, complete Louisville flow in, in some direction. So I don't, I don't need both directions in, in, uh, in at least one direction. Uh, and let's say this, uh, you, the flow of it flows into the pole P. So the picture is uh, that I have this pole P here and uh, my domain U maybe has some shape like this. So all of these flow lines, they all uh, flow into my pole P. <clears throat> so uh, then the statement uh, roughly is that, um, so th first of all, there is a subsectorial neighborhood S prime 
of S, again, with the same opening. Such that, um, such that my system has a solution, in fact, unique, um, which, um, which is subdominant as, uh, as x as we flow into the pole P along the flow lines, along Deville flow lines. And in fact, this solution, and this is basically where you get uniqueness. Um, so as I take the asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to zero, this solution uh, has the form, um, now there could be a minus, there yeah, there's probably a minus, lambda minus over h bar times uh, something, uh, times a power series in h bar. So you get the leading, in other words, this, this describes for you the leading order asymptotics uh, in h bar. Okay, so for, for geometers, uh, there's, a, there's a nicer way of explaining everything that I just wrote, which is, um, so let, that part, let me say it in words. Uh, this is basically the, the main construction of the paper that I referenced in the, uh, in the abstract, which is that, so normally, when, when we have a system of differential equations, uh, there is a simple fact for, uh, that if I'm studying uh, solutions, Near a, sim, uh, near a singularity, then um, the, you could say uh, the space of solutions or equivalently um, the space of initial conditions near a singular point, uh, that's a vector space. That vector space is uh, filtered by growth rates of solutions as I parallel transport them into, uh, into a singular point. Um, so this is this is just classical ODEs, uh, nothing special there. And I can I can in fact do that in families. So for every uh, value of h bar, I can construct such a filtration by growth rates. And then there's a uh, there's a natural question: uh, these filtrations for different values of h bar, how do they interact with one another? That's question number one. And question number two is if I uh, look at this family of filtrations and take uh, the limit as h bar goes to zero. So I go into the vertex of, uh, of the sectorial neighborhood in h bar. How, what happens with this filtration? Uh, and so the thing that I prove in, in that preprint is that, um, th so these filtrations by growth rates indeed form a smooth or holomorphic family over the sectorial neighborhood. And as h bar goes to zero, uh, they have a limit, and the limit is nothing but uh, basically the eigenvalue decomposition of the leading order matrix. So the leading order matrix uh, A0 of x, uh, that has uh, an eigenvalue decomposition. The filtration by growth rates limits precisely to that eigenvalue decomposition. And furthermore, if I, if I take this filtration and flow it into the pole, that limits to the eigenvalue decomposition of the, the principal part. So, so in other words, if I have a singularly perturbed uh, system, um, there is two limiting systems that I, or two limiting problems that I can consider. One, which is uh, h bar goes to zero. So that gives me uh, some kind of algebraic problem. Um, and another one, which is if I uh, flow into the pole, I can consider the polar, uh, the data at the pole. Uh, so both of those are algebraic problems. Um, each one of them has an eigenvalue decomposition on my vector space or vector bundle. Um, and the statement is that over this uh, uh, total parameter space, x cross h bar, there is a filtration. Uh, which limits to one eigenvalue decomposition as h bar goes to zero and to another eigenvalue decomposition as we go into the pole. 
so it's yeah so basically that's that's the geometric that's the geometric statement um, okay any any questions about that so I left myself uh, like seven minutes to describe the proof <laughs> the proof is very long the proof of uh, how to construct the solution is very long but let me let me just uh, maybe explain the the core basic ideas um, so if there are any questions in the meantime. So. Can I ask a question? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it um, when epsilon or epsilon or h bar is not zero, then in that region, is it clear that this uh, sub bundle varies smoothly or homomorphic? Yeah, that part, that part is pretty simple. That's basically uh, one way to get it is uh, you you take the usual proof of existence and uniqueness for ODEs, and you insert h bar everywhere, and just at appropriate points check that things remain holomorphic. So that that part is that part is not difficult. Uh, because what, you just need to find the subdominant solution, and that gives you a section that's holomorphic. Yeah, but the point is that a subdominant solution, right? Uh, you can multiply it by any constant. And in this case, the constant can depend on h bar. So in particular, I can multiply it by a constant whose h bar asymptotics are completely screwed up. So the question is that of, can I find a subdominant solution which is normalized in such a way that you know, this integration constant, which can depend on h bar, doesn't cause any trouble as h bar goes to zero. Uh, and that, that is very hard. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Nikita, so we yeah. probably should wrap up soon. So uh, yeah, if you can say a couple of words about your ideas of proof. Right, so uh, yeah. So, so the basic idea is to first solve the equation. So let me write down the equation again. H bar d by dx f is equal to f, uh, af squared plus bf plus c. So the basic idea is to first solve it formally, like we did. Um, so first solve formally. So we get this uh, formal uh, differential equation, formal in h bar, <clears throat> which can be solved, provided the assumption on the discriminant, etc. Um, and uh, then what I want to do is I want to apply the Borel transform uh, to it uh, and, and kind of, uh, I will get some kind of power series, some other power series, and I will want to extend that and, um, and apply Laplace transform. So all of that uh, kind of is easier said than done. Uh, so let me, Mar Mar yes. Marta, you have a question? I am a little bit confused because we were talking about the system now. Yes, yeah, so now that, that uh, no. end, end so, environment. <laughs> and environment, uh, new environment. So, <laughs> which proof are you making then? Uh, so now I'm proving uh, the the asymptotic existence. In oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to. So I want. Right, right. So okay. I just want to explain how to construct the solution to the Riccati equation. Okay, okay. So basically, the uh, yeah the 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 moral of uh, everything I said about motivation, about the exact WKB and, and the systems and connections, et cetera, is that there are all of these very interesting problems in geometry, uh, which boil down to uh, ability of solving a, a, a singularly perturbed Riccati equation by fixing its asymptotics. So if you can do that, then you can solve all of those other problems. Um, okay, so how do, you, how do you actually solve a singularly perturbed Riccati equation? So first, uh, so you solve it formally. Uh, so you have this uh, formal solution f hat. Um, the, 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 the first kind of key step is to simplify by uh, removing leading and subleading, meaning in h bar orders of this equation. So you just you could say you expand uh, up to order two this equation and just uh, 
cancel the first two orders. And what you get is, so you can simplify your equation to one that looks like this, uh, f hat minus f hat is equal to h bar a hat prime plus b hat prime f, oh, sorry, maybe uh, f hat squared plus b hat prime f hat plus c hat, like this. And now the point, uh, the point here is now if I, so uh, the second step is apply Borel transform, which you really should think of as inverse Laplace transform, but somehow in a formal, in a formal sense, because these are formal power series in H bar. Um, so you do this term by term. And what you get um, is an equation uh, that looks like this. So I just want to give the key kind of geometric idea behind the proof. Uh, you will get an equation. So just by using kind of properties of Laplace transform or inverse Laplace transform, you know that, for example, multiplying by one over h bar uh, gives you differentiation. So xi, xi is the a variable that is dual to h bar uh, under the Borel Laplace transformation. Um, so if I if I take this uh, equation, multiply it by you know divide through by h bar then uh, this term has no h bar in it. This term, the, the right hand side, the h bar will disappear. But this, uh, this part here will be multiplied by h bar inverse. And so that's what will give me uh, differentiation with respect to psi. And then the right hand side is some expression in terms of, uh, in terms of sigma, sigma being, sorry, sigma is the Borel transform of f hat like this. So, uh, well, maybe just to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, it has this form alpha plus beta uh, convolution sigma plus gamma convolution sigma convolution sigma. So it's a, it's a nonlinear PDE with a convolution term. So it looks uh, rather menacing. But the, the key point, and this is the kind of geometric input, which is that if you look at the, uh, the differential part of this PDE, this is a first order PDE, it can be, I guess the right term is, it can be linearized. Um, so if you, if you change coordinates, if you use Louisville transformation, which is to say you introduce a new coordinate, Z, which is uh, going to be integration, again, from some fixed uh, base point to x. If I integrate the square root of the discriminant, then uh, the point is that um, under, under this change of variables, this horrible looking differential, uh, this horrible look looking vector field becomes nothing but d by dz. And so the equation that you end up with is one that looks uh, like this. So uh, sigma hat, uh, uh, sigma tilt here is just uh, I guess pulled back by the inverse of phi of sigma. Um, and now this, uh, this is really nice because this uh, is a first order PD with constant coefficients. Um, and you can write this equivalently as, a, as an integral equation. So what you get is that sigma tilde should satisfy uh, uh, an integral equation, which roughly speaking looks like this. Uh, so all this, all this right-hand side, alpha plus beta convolve sigma plus gamma convolve sigma convolve sigma. So sigma, oh, these should have tilts. So sigma tilde should be a solution to this integral equation. Um, and now an integral equation, uh, you can solve by method of successive approximations where you, uh, you construct a sequence, an infinite sequence 
uh, sigma uh, sigma n's, each one uh, kind of successively, successively approximating the solution, uh, such that the uh, the total sum of them, uh, at least considered formally, is a solution of this integral equation. Um, so that's that's uh, not too difficult. You can write down a formula. It's a bit long, so I won't write it. Um, uh, but you you can determine each one of these sigma ends recursively, and then and then that's where the heavy analysis kicks in because then you need to sh check that well all of these sigma ends are holomorphic, uh, and that this uh, total sum this formal sum uh, in fact is uniformly convergent. So it it defines a function for you, and then furthermore uh, the last step is that. I need to, you see, I, I solved it kind of by going through the Borel transform or inverse Laplace transform. So now I need to go back. So I need to check that this uh, uh, function sigma tilde, that I can apply a Laplace transform to it and, and get something analytic. So all of that requires a lot of kind of bounding and est estimation. Um, Nikita, but that's, yeah? that's basically the end of the proof. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. You start Talking about uniform convergence, I think it's a good it's a good time to stop. Well, thanks a lot.